I lay in the bed of a dead man, he tells us, felt the curvature of the mattress that had once pressed against his body, and stared at the very ceiling which had been his last view of this world. One of the strangest stories Fonte ever wrote, the case of the haunted writer reads like unwitting but disturbingly accurate self-psychoanalysis, all the more so when we note that about the same time he was writing it, the late 1940s, he was also working on a melodramatic movie script about a magician's doomed search for the secret of raising the dead, a murder mystery called The Long Nightmare. For a writer like Fonte, famous for the exuberance of his prose and the fullness of his characters' emotional lives, all this emphasis not only on the dead and nightmarish efforts to raise them, but also on writers who can't seem to write, may strike us as odd, if not perverse. But ponder this. Reviewing the John Fonte Reader in the New York Times, Janet Maslin has suggested that of all the subjects Fonte tackled, none brought out the best in him more than writer's block. Maslin continues, Fonte was paradoxically eloquent and effusive about wordlessness, making it a haunting, the word again, a haunting symbol of any artist's isolation. And it's true. From the earliest to the latest, his writings trace this darkly comic theme, the writer's lifelong struggle with writing. Usually, the struggle is right there in front of us, as in Ask the Dust, when for two full days Arturo squares off with his typewriter in the longest siege of hard work in his life, and not one line done, only two words written over and over across the page, palm tree, palm tree, palm tree. <laughs> or later, when Arturo has an idea and it floats harmlessly through the room like a small white bird, it meant no ill will, it only wanted to help me, but I would strike at it hammer it out across the keyboard, and it would die. Or then again, I was scared and worried as I sat before my typewriter, and a great awful void descended. I beat my head with my fists, but it was useless. Or in the short story, The Dreamer, after three days, all I had to show for the ferment of my brain was wads of crushed paper. I pounded my head, rolled on the bed, trying to salvage a few sentences. At other times, the writer's anxiety is displaced. In Alter Boy, again, his first published story, for example, young Jimmy Toscana accepts the gift of a stolen fountain pen, then tries to brazen out his reaction. A fountain pen does not scare me, Jimmy claims, but I wanted to run away. Fountain pens are nothing. It's nuts to be scared of them. But I was scared about something. No amount of denial prevents the fear of fountain pens or typewriters, which is to say, the fear of writing, from returning to the surface, as it does on the last page of the last novel Fonte would ever write, Dreams from Bunker Hill. For the nth and last time, Arturo sits down at his typewriter, hoping to write only a single sentence. But suppose I failed, he thinks. Suppose I had lost all my beautiful talent. Suppose it had burned up and was dead forever. What would happen to me? This is the fear that haunts writers. It's a major reason, I suspect, why Fonte is held in such high esteem by so many writers, for he tells the truth about how we can feel and makes us laugh at ourselves. By the same token, he also tells the truth about the joy that overtakes us when the block dissolves. That's when Arturo's voice soars highest. Six weeks, a few sweet hours every day, three and four and sometimes five delicious hours with the pages piling up and all other desires asleep. I felt like a ghost walking the earth, a lover of man and beast alike, and wonderful waves of tenderness flooded me when I talked to people and mingled with them in the streets. God Almighty, dear God, be good to me, gave me a sweet tongue, and these sad and lonely folk will hear me, and they shall be happy. Thus the days passed, dreamy, luminous days, and sometimes such great quiet joy came to me that I would turn out my lights and cry, and a strange desire to die would come to me. Thus Bandini writing a novel. In 1938, Fonte had sent his editor at Stackpole Books a long, extraordinary letter, written, we can surmise, in that same fugue-like state of oneness with his writing. In this letter, 
Fonte projected the passage that I have just quoted, even as he outlined the whole plot of Ask the Dust. In 1990, Black Sparrow Press published that letter as prologue to Ask the Dust. At the time, when I read it, I was amazed by the prophetic clarity of its vision. At the same time, the ending felt abrupt, even truncated, so that when, years later, alone in the Fonte house amidst mountains of paper, I came upon a brittle brown sheet of text script that seemed to fit nowhere, it dawned on me. I had discovered the missing last page of the prologue. The complete prologue to Ask the Dust can now be found in Fonte's final posthumous book, The Big Hunger, along with other previously unread stories I found buried in those cavernous file cabinets, among others, The Criminal, To Be a Monstrous Clever Fellow, and I Am a Writer of Truth. And suddenly, there it is, the line of a life, rich, winding, inevitable, from confused juvenile criminality to early and mid-adult monstrosity, to the truth, and yes, timeless and haunting beauty that comes only with age. That's the line I endeavored to trace in my biography of John Fonte. And why? Because, as Richard Holmes puts it, gazing into the intensely burning point of a single life provides the biographer with an instrument of moral precision and analysis, a way of making sense of his own world. But what was it Fonte said about literary biographers in a 1972 letter to Carrie McWilliams? Oh yes, now I remember. A curious fact about biographers of writers is their stubborn resistance to reality. <laughs> Talk about a glass of ice water in the face. But Carrie himself was an accomplished literary biographer of the arch-ironist Ambrose Bierce, who in The Devil's Dictionary defined biography as the literary tribute that a little man pays to a big one. <laughs> but Fonte knew who he was writing to when he wrote to his lifelong friend and how to write with his tongue in his cheek. I like to think that the ironic severity of Fonte's pronouncement prodded me on in my efforts to convey the realities of his life and to weigh the real value of his works. Ultimately, it's for others to judge how well I did or didn't do, and I take responsibility for all my failures. If I have any regrets, and I do, chief among them might be that I didn't go far enough. As far, for example, as my former student, now friend, novelist, and journalist, Alan Rifkin has gone, in assessing Fonte's importance. In an elegant and expansive cover story in the Los Angeles Times Magazine entitled Writing in the Dust, Allen has shown why Ask the Dust deserves to be recognized as the seminal wellspring of much, if not all, contemporary Los Angeles writing, a rich and varied school that can rightly be called Southern California dream realism. As failures go, that's one I can live with. And in any event, what a strange thing failure can be. My Dog Stupid is about a washed up writer, consumed with guilt for his failures as a writer, a husband, father and a man. No wonder I couldn't finish a novel anymore, he confesses. To write one must love, and to love one must understand. In November 1960, John and Joyce's eldest son, Nick, disappeared, leaving behind a note imbued with a gnawing sense of failure. A brilliant young man, Nick had been operating the mechanical horse race attraction on the pier at Pacific Ocean Park, a textbook case of underachievement. Now he was imploring his parents not to try to discover his plans or his whereabouts. Hoping to signal a father's concern, and yes, a father's understanding and love, Fonte wrote to a friend of the family who he thought might know something of Nick's flight. We want, him, we want to tell him that whether he fails or not in this world is not important to us, John wrote. Success is too vague a challenge. Maybe even failure is better. Certainly, it is more beautiful. We should all fail half so beautifully as John Fonte. Thank you. Well, he, um, 
he was very happy to have the work as a very young man, 23 or 4 years old, when he first signed on at Warner Brothers. This was the, the deepest part of the Depression, so it was a wonderful job to have. Um, his attitude towards screenwriting was always utterly unsentimental. It was, it was a job. He did it uh, for a paycheck. Uh, and uh, his, his heart was always with his fiction. Following on that question, when he moved to LA, did, did he move in part because it was a center for writing, or is that secondary? You know, I think not, Bob. Um, if he wanted to go to a, the center of writing, he would have gone to New York. Interesting choice that he went the opposite direction, which I think fits with his often contrarian personality. Uh, John Fonte wasn't a joiner. Um, you know, he was skeptical of the world in many respects, and didn't go out of his way to fit in. I think the only organization he ever joined, or at least the only one he maintained membership in, was the Writers Guild of America, which he believed in. Um, uh, so LA over New York, 1930, fits in that general, I think, sort of temperament and outlook. Jeannie and then John. Um, Steve, I wonder if you could talk about um, what happened in between the time you first contacted Joyce Fonte um, uh, for permission to uh, to write the biography, and um, I know that was a that was quite a long time. And so, what happened that made her put that key in your hand that day? Yeah, um, Joyce was any as anyone who knew her will I think agree. Formidable woman who understood um, the value of her husband's uh, talent. She had been approached several times by writers who had proposed writing the biography and declined. When I wrote my letter to her, I heard nothing from her for some time, some weeks, I would say, maybe some months. And then I had a response from a representative of hers who, after some correspondence between myself and him, had me out to the house in Malibu. Uh, we sat on the patio. No, she didn't invite me in the house <laughs> the first time. Does that sound like your mom? Uh, she was taking my measure, I think, uh, sizing me up, seeing if one of this might be the guy. Uh, and I didn't keep a checklist, but there were several such meetings before I was invited in the, into the dining room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then uh, one day she sprung a surprise question on me. And the question was, what do you really want to do? I, I didn't really have a, an answer prepared. So I winged it. I said, I, I want to tell the truth about John Fonte. And that did it. Um, through no real planning or strategy or cunning on my part, that did it. Uh, she, she took me that day into the service porch <laughs> and <laughs> invited me to start opening these enormous uh, file cabinets and going through them. Yes? I wonder if uh, you would tell the story of how he lost the job uh, with Orson Welles. <laughs> the, job, the story he told me. You'll have to tell that story. Um, uh, the story that I recall, actually this may be the same story, was that he didn't lose the job so much as Orson pissed away, literally. <laughs> uh, Orson Welles had signed on with RKO and the government, if I'm not mistaken, of Brazil to do uh, an enormous uh, film project aimed at improving and solidifying American, US, and Latin American relations with the World War II raging. Uh, Orson Welles uh, was sent as a, an ambassador of goodwill uh, to make this movie, which would have been, as one film historian calls it, the greatest. He, this film has been called the greatest nonfiction film never made. It was the beginning of Orson Welles' long 
steady decline.